Hello, everyone, and welcome to the to the to our Naval Postgraduate School Secretary of the Navy guest lecture series. I am the NPS President Ann Rondo, and I'm thrilled and honored to have with us Admiral Jim Stavridis, our guest speaker, and our NPS uh, Emeritus faculty and professor and scholar, former chair of the Defense Analysis Department, Dr. John Arquilla, as our moderator. They are titans in their professions. Dr. John R. Quilla and Admiral Jim Stavridis. It's remarkable to have these two extraordinary minds and intellects and scholars and warfighters within us at this moment today. I will say to you that Admiral, uh, Admiral Stavridis' most recent book, 2034, that was out March of this year, and Dr. R. Quilla's Bits Creek that came out in September have made the rounds. And I'm around many different senior officers who have mentioned those two books as seminal to their new thinking about the new problems and the new world. So for our guest speaker, the Admiral and Dr. Jim Stavridis, he retired in 2013, as you all know from his bio, and, and as a, as a four-star naval officer of extraordinary renown and successful leadership for 37 years. He commanded the USS Barry in the at, at Atlantic Fleet, winning the Battenberg Cup for the most outstanding ship within the fleet. He also, of course, had other kinds of many commands, including a Desron and a carrier strike group in combat. He served as, as U.S. Southern Command, but he was also the Supreme Allied Commander with responsibility for Afghanistan, Libya, the Balkans, Syria, counter piracy and cyber security from 2009 until his retirement. If that is not relevant today, then nothing is. After he retired, Jim continued, the Admiral continued to just lead constantly. He was the 12th Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He's currently the Vice Chair of Global Affairs of the Carlisle Group and the Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Rockefeller Foundation. And as I noted, he has published 10 books and hundreds of articles in leading journals and his and his TED talk has had about a million views. But what's remarkable about, uh, about the Admiral and the many years I have known him is that he challenges everybody to write and to think. And his, his challenge to young officers to have the courage to write is one of the primary themes that the Admiral always has. So about our moderator, Dr. John R. Quilla, he is a professor and a, and a very distinguished scholar and advisor and author. He is a distinguished professor emeritus of defense analysis here at N NPS, where he taught from 1993 until his retirement this year in 2021. He's been an advisor to all manner of civilian leaders during Operation uh, Desert Storm, the Kosovo War, and he's been involved in several post 9-11 matters, such as testifying in front of uh, Congress on countering terrorist networks. He has served on all kinds of small teams for President o Obama and other leaders to help identify new directions for American defense. And like the Admiral, he has authored dozens of books covering a range of topics from irregular warfare to strategies for improving cyber security. And I will say, when I came here as the president of NPS, and John knows this, I asked for John to, to let me read some of his books and that he had identified as his best pieces of, of work. And John R. Quill has taught me many things. So students, faculty, staff, and friends, please help me welcome our guest 
Admiral James Stav Readers, and Dr. John R. Quiller, over to you, sir. Thank you so much, President Rondo. And, and thank you, Admiral Stavridis, for joining us today. Uh, I, I couldn't endorse more strongly uh, the, the president's comments about your admonition to all to, to write and to think. I would only add to it, you're also someone who greatly encourages people to read. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, leader's bookshelf that uh, you wrote a book about. And I, I was just fascinated to see the the wide and diverse range of, of topics and sources that uh, you went to for inspiration about uh, leadership. Uh, what we're going to try to do today is to spend the first half of the conversation covering uh, specific topics in uh, technology, uh, geography, and, and uh, geopolitics, uh, the issues of ideology that uh, matter still very much in, in the world, uh, and more broadly questions in, in strategy. Uh, we'll conclude with uh, the Admiral's comments on some insights about leadership, but I, I hope that this, uh, the breadth of this conversation is very much in line with what uh, Secretary of the Navy Del Toro has uh, called for recently, which is uh, a great breadth and depth in uh, graduate education. And specifically, he gave a shout out uh, to the uh, Naval Postgraduate School in, in his uh, statement about that. And, and I know that as the Navy's research university, we do our best every day to try to, to meet that uh, challenge. So our first topic area has to do with, with technology. And uh, Admiral Stavridis has uh, written a, a, a wonderful uh, a book about what the next uh, great conflict might look like. In fact, it, it harkens in many ways to the predictive power of Hector Bywater's The Great Pacific War, which he wrote 100 years ago and anticipated carrier warfare, surprise attacks, kamikazes. Uh, in, in this case, uh, the Admiral has looked at the ways in which advanced information technology both empower our military, but also make it vulnerable uh, to disruption or to what some of us like to call it, I call in my book, mass disruption. So uh, a few thoughts uh, beginning with this uh, issue you raised, Admiral, about both strength and vulnerability being part of flip sides of the same coin. Over to you, Admiral. You know, so often um, our greatest strength is our greatest vulnerability, right? And we know that in life, in our personality, in the way we interact with others, it's a very common part of being human. And I think as, as we look at technology and our growing dependence on it, we ought to just bear in mind that there is always going to be another turn of the wheel and that the degree to which we become completely captive of a particular technology can lead us to doom. And, you know, this is, I hope, will be a conversation with a lot of historical and literary references. So let me take you back 600 years ago to 1415 to the Battle of Agincourt. And here we see the French knights who have the highest technology of the military age, plate armor. And they believe themselves to be invulnerable in this plate armor. And on a muddy field 600 years ago facing Henry V and his English archers, they discovered that their technology upon which they were completely dependent was no longer supreme on the battlefield. They charged 30,000 of them across a muddy field. And by the way, here's another lesson of history. If it had not rained the night before, if the field was not so muddy, could they have moved more swiftly and overcome those archers, perhaps. But that was not the hand of cards they were dealt. And in their arrogance and in their certainty, in their technology, they rode across their field. And of those 30,000, almost all were slaughtered by 7,000 English longbowmen, an extraordinary new technology. It had been on the field in various ways, but never was it more suddenly apparent that technology could be your greatest strength and suddenly 
your greatest weakness. I think there's a lesson in that. And by the way, from a literary perspective, I hope many of you read the novels of Bernard Cornwall, Sharp's Regiment, um, an extraordinary writer, kind of the Patrick O'Brien of land warfare. And um, he wrote a one-off, not part of the series novel, about that battle called Agincourt, which I just read. And um, it's terrific, and it unpackages all of this. So, John, the answer to the question is yes, you can become utterly dependent on a new glamorous technology, be it cyber, space, artificial intelligence, something in biology, energy, nanotechnology. It'll enable you. It'll move you forward. But does it create a potential Achilles heel? Often it does. Well, that's a terrific example, uh, Admiral. And it, it gets me thinking about that Hundred Years' War, which the French do end up uh, winning in, in part because of cultivating artillery technology. <laughs> but there was a bigger story, which was about geography. It is Britain's effort to try to hold land on, on the continent. So let's move to the, to the question of geography. I mean, you are among the, the, the few of our senior military leaders to have held, well, Southern Command, Supreme Commander, NATO, but you had global responsibilities uh, there. And, and so it, it seems in, in geographical terms today, uh, certainly the United States and its friends have to think about a range of different areas and possibly the need to shift in emphasis from a Cold War era in which Europe was a primary emphasis to the Pacific region. I know Colonel Trier is going to have something to say about this a little bit uh, later in the uh, discussion with the, uh, with the students. Uh, but uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, how geography is still mattering in our time? <laughs> um, well, I'm sure many of you have read the books of Robert Kaplan, who is a, a, a fantastic geopolitical writer. Um, and, you know, he's a journalist, essentially, but he's, he's become a very deep writer in, 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 in a variety of different high-end uh, topics here. His book, The Revenge of Geography, just the title kind of tells you everything you need to know. Um, I wrote a book uh, along these lines uh, called Sea Power, The History and Geopolitics of the World's Oceans. And it was a book that tried to take um, instead of having characters, it had oceans as the central organizing theme. In effect, each of the oceans became a character in the in the not in the not in the novel in the book. And um, in it, I would say the character ocean that has the highest potential is the Indian Ocean. And if you think about it, it's the third largest ocean in the world, um, and yet it's largely un charred, not uncharted, but largely unexploited. And of course, India dominates it. And, and part of the big story, the big muscle movement in the 21st century geopolitically, in my view, is going to be not the rise of China, which I think is already peaking and maybe declining. It's going to be the rise of India because of demographics and a number of other factors we could discuss. But part of why I believe in the rise of India is the Indian Ocean. This vast body of water, unexploited, India dominates it with its coastlines, and it is um, an example, uh, Professor, of how geography will continue to matter. And, and we could kind of walk around the world. Um, the other one I'll, I'll mention is perhaps the obvious one, and, and here um, Robert Kaplan has written a specific book, not about the general importance of geography, but about specifically the South China Sea. And it has a very evocative title, Asia's Cauldron. Like a cauldron is a, a big pot bubbling, you know, like in Macbeth with the witches around it. And as that fire burns around the edges of that cauldron, dangerous things happen. And if you look at the South China Sea, it's this enormous cauldron, right? It's China, Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, Australia, a little corner of it. It is a bubbling pot. And boy, it would be difficult to create uh, a greater hotspot in global geopolitics than the South China Sea. And 
I'm sure we'll discuss later on Taiwan and the potential of conflict there. The novel 2034 that I write about a war with China begins where? In the South China Sea with a miscalculation. And so, yeah, geography matters. And and by the way, you know, I'll, I'll take the admiral's prerogative here and say the oceans really matter. We have a tendency to think that it's all about the land borders. Uh, maybe today we think a lot, John, your wonderful books like Bitskrieg about the cyber wars and the cyber borders or lack thereof. But those oceans matter. And 70% of the world covered by water. Supply chains choking today. Why? Because of the oceans. And an important aspect of all this is to understand your point, John, that geography really matters. It matters for information technology uh, uh, too. When I think about the uh, roughly 400 fiber optic cables oh. on the ocean floors around the world, 97% of all international communications go across them. And uh, well, the Russians have uh, developed a, a, a robot uh, that can be deployed from a submarine that goes down and can either tap into or sever uh, these things. It's uh, it's really uh, quite troubling and goes to your, your larger theme from 2034 about the mass disruptive effects when information flows are, right. are blockaded. And, uh, I, or so. and of course, I can neither confirm nor deny that the US has a similar capability. Well, have a little more of that uh, Uzo Admiral, and maybe we'll get you to say some more about that. <laughs> and uh, I once uh, went to an event with Norman Mailer. He had a big carafe of what looked like water. And by the mid-range of the meeting, it was very clear that it was gin. <laughs> if if not vodka. Yeah, I, I love your point about the Indian Ocean from uh, from your book on, on sea power. And it, it, India is geographically poised like a dagger at that Indian Ocean. Yeah, um, can I make another point about that? Of course. Um, we talk all the time about China and it's one belt, one road, which is mm -hmm. terrific grand strategy, makes a lot of sense. Um, finished products flow out, raw materials flow in, all across that belt and road, you create geopolitical and geoeconomic influence. One belt, one road. It's got one big problem, and the problem is India, which is parked right in the middle of it geographically and also philosophically, ideologically, not ready, the Indians, to sign up and to go gently into that good night with the Chinese. It is big casino, the role of India in the 21st century. Here, here. Uh, from ge geopolitics, geostrategy, let's talk a little bit about ideology. We uh, came out of a Cold War world, which was a story of freedom against totalitarianism. Uh, the freedom agenda is clearly still on the table. What's on what's on the other side? It's, uh, you know, Russia uh, after the Cold War seemingly became democratic, but it's really like something out of czarist days. Uh, China's still communist, but how communist and how capitalist are they? Uh, what is going to be the role of, of ideology? And we know we've come out of some conflicts with ideologically driven non-state actors in the last 20 years. And, and we find that, you know, the determination, the motivation that comes with that ideology has uh, worn down will, as, as we've seen in, in Afghanistan over, over time. So what's the place of, of ideology in this time and, and where does the freedom agenda stand in a world that even among NATO allies is sometimes moving in the direction of more authoritarianism? So I hate it when people do this, I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, I wrote an article which was the cover story in Time Magazine and I encourage you to go back and, and take a look at it. Just Google Stavridis, Time Magazine, democracy it'll pop right up. I wrote it three years ago. I stand by the ideas in that article, which are as follows. I wouldn't bet against democracy. I would not bet against it. And one salient point I think here, John, is just look at the long throw of history. Um, you know, as you look at human society, it becomes uh, pretty unstructured, shall we say, and then becomes extremely authoritarian. The ideas of democracy are relatively new, maybe 250 years old, all in, and yet 
look at how they have progressed in, you know, arguably 10% of the time of human history. Let's let's stipulate 2,000 years. Last 200 years, democracy's taken off like a rocket compared to where it was. And even a hundred years ago, go back to pre-World War I, there were 13 democracies in the world. Today, you can score it in different ways, but there are somewhere between 80 and 100, maybe 120 democracies of one form or another. I'm kind of with Winston Churchill here who said, you know, democracy, it's the worst form of government, except for all the others. And, and his point was, human nature abhors a boss. No one wants someone telling you what you're doing. You know, exhibit A of the moment would be, you gotta take a vaccine. People don't like to be told what to do, even when it's the right thing to do. And so I think both as I look historically at the, the long throw of history, and secondly, I look at human nature And thirdly, and I'll close with this because I could go on for quite some time, but if you look at the, quote, rise of authoritarianism, wait a minute, let's step back from that and unpackage it. The two big authoritarian states are Russia and China. Newsflash, they've always been authoritarian. They have never been democracies, and I mean never. So this idea that suddenly authoritarian states are taking over the world, I don't think stands up. And so if you want geopolitics 101 in the 21st century, you know, watch my hands here. Here's authoritarianism. It's Russia and China. And yeah, they're gaining some adherence here and there to their model, by the way, of capitalism and authoritarianism. And I guarantee you over time, capitalism is gonna win that foot race. But over here are the democratic states, capitalist, value-oriented democracies. That's the US, European Union, Japan, uh, our allies around the world. Those are the two central nodes. What's right here in the middle? India. And where India ends up on this curve is gonna matter. And that's why you don't see paragraph one about why India is like really important. India, I think ends up over here. And you know, who knows, this is gonna play out over the next 50 years. I would bet on India as fractious and as difficult and the many challenges they face, I'm gonna bet on India to kind of come this way. And assuming that is true, this critical mass will outmaster this critical mass particularly given the constraints of human nature that I think will drive it. Nobody knows, but that's my thesis of the case. And um, that's why I would still bet on democracy. Uh, Well, it's uh, useful and important for us to note that India is the world's largest democracy. It's going to have this big role in world affairs. Uh, Good that they're in that that camp already. Yeah, Uh, let me me give you a quote on that, which is uh, President Bush, uh, 43, when he went to India, he said, I bring greetings from the world's oldest democracy to the world's largest democracy. That's a powerful line if you stop and think about it. And by the way, in that largest democracy, um, a population 1.3 billion people, 800 million people voted in the last election. Think about that. We had a lot of trouble turning out just over 100 million here in the United States. 800 million Indians turned out to vote. Um, I wouldn't bet against democracy. Well, may both great democracies be sustained. Uh, we're uh, getting close to the uh, to the half hour here. So what I'd like to do is combine our, our discussion a little bit of uh, strategy and, and leadership. I think, of course, leadership plays a tremendous role in, in strategy uh, setting. Uh, but uh, I, I hope on, on the one hand, you would uh, speak a little bit to uh, not just American strategy, but American grand strategy these days. Uh, a sea power thinker is by necessity a grand strategist, uh, but uh, also how that relates to the notion of how uh, the cultivation of, of leadership 
can make for a good grand strategy. And in that regard, I mentioned earlier your uh, leader's bookshelf. And I just want to say for all in the campus community, you really must have, have a look at that and the wide range of, of interesting from short stories by Joseph Conrad about a, a sea captain who's uh, sheltering someone who may or may not have caused a murder uh, to uh, Anton Myrer's wonderful uh, Once an Eagle uh, story, which spans from basically World War I to uh, Vietnam to many, many other uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, readings. It fascinates me how uh, broadly and widely you've drawn for insights into uh, to leadership. So if you could address both those issues in in uh, four or five minutes, and then we'll uh, move on to uh, Major Underwood. You'll be the uh, first of the uh, of the questioners, but over to you, Admiral. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I, I want to begin by going back to Lieutenant Commander Jim Stavridis and Lieutenant Commander Ann Rondeau. And uh, we were, uh, you know, mid-career officers, I suppose, at that point. We had lots in common. But what we deeply shared was an appreciation of reading and the power of reading to influence leaders. And And so many times we would exchange book ideas and um, you know, I've had that kind of relationship with only a few people, and and I do just want to say publicly, Anne Rondeau, Vice Admiral Rondeau, President Rondeau, how much your friendship has meant to me over the years, and this is a good point to to make. And and by the way, um, in the handful of people who have really uh, spent a fair amount of time with me talking about books, another one I'm sure who has been and uh, been part of this conversation is uh, Jim Mattis, who is a great reader and a, a thought leader in many ways. Um, so without broadening the discussion to the thousand different things I could say about leadership, I wanna really focus on reading and leading because I think the two go hand in hand. And, and the reason for that is that every time you pick up a book, you're entering a simulator. You are putting yourself in the center of a completely different universe than you're normally in the middle of. And that can be, I think, particularly powerful in fiction, but certainly in nonfiction as well. But where it becomes a simulator is when you say to yourself, what would I do right now? And as I put together the books in the leader's bookshelf, I tried to think of books that would allow particularly young leaders to think about, you know, what would I do in that moment? And, you know, there are in that uh, book a lot of, if you will, the normal books that are on every commandant's reading list and every CNO's reading list. But um, one in particular I want to uh, just park on for 30 seconds is a novel that everybody on this call probably read when they were 13 or 14 years old. And that novel is To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. And if you can remember that far back, you'll remember what it's about. It's about a trial in the South of a black man falsely accused of a rape. It's about justice, about discrimination, about a young girl coming of age who watches her father make choices of extraordinary integrity to defend this accused rapist. It's a story about America today, yet it was written over 50 years ago. It is a perfect novel. And if you think about my premise that a great novel is one in which you insert yourself and you ask yourself, could I have been Atticus Finch? Could I have stepped up and done the right thing at enormous cost to myself, to my life, and put my family at risk? It's a pretty extraordinary novel. That's in the leader's bookshelf. I'll give you another one that I, I just reread. And by the way, I'm a big believer in rereading books. You know, the, the Plains... Native Americans say you never cross the same river twice. And why is that? Because the river moves on. And it's like that with books. 
you never read the same book twice because you've changed. You bring such a different sensibility. When you read a book 40 years later, when I read To Kill a Mockingbird for the second time in my 50s, it was a completely different novel, a completely different experience set, by the way, with the backdrop of a completely different America. So the second book that I've read, and, and you'll probably chuckle at this, but is Stephen King's novel, The Stand. And if you've not read it, stop everything you're doing and go and read it. Because how does it begin? With a massive pandemic, a super flu, except instead of the relatively benign COVID that we're dealing with, it has 99% transmissibility and a 99% lethality rate. And if you don't think that's possible, you're not paying attention. And so it begins with that and then moves on to how does the world deal with the circumstances? People take a stand. They are for good or they are for evil. It's a profoundly powerful, powerful novel. So I'll close with uh, two other books I've been reading lately. Again, back to that idea of simulation and thinking about um, the world we're in now. And, and people say to me, oh, Stavridis, you know, you wrote that novel, 2034, about a war with China. You must have been thinking about Cold War literature, U.S.-Soviet stumbling into a war. No, I was thinking about World War I. I was thinking about Barbara Tuckman's magisterial book, The Guns of August, about how Europe, where all these economies were intertwined, where these families were interrelated by marriage. The Kaiser was the grandson of Queen Victoria of England. All of that, impossible they would go to war. Not how it turned out. In the summer of 1914, an assassin's bullet in a dusty corner of the Austro-Hungarian Empire creates a conflagration. Four years later, the Kaiser's Germany is gone. The Austro-Hungarian Empire is gone. The Russian Empire is gone. The Ottoman Empire is gone. You know, as human beings, we are programmed to kind of think that tomorrow is going to be a lot like today. Yeah, maybe a few changes, but it'll be a lot like today. Boy, that's not the lesson of history. So I'll close on that one, The Guns of August, a geopolitical thriller that is all too true. John? A great war that began with an act of terrorism and then drew in all the powers. And uh, in a world where our war on terror has morphed into terror's war on the world, it's quintupled terrorism has over the last 20 years. I think we have to worry about that. And for those who will read uh, 2034, and I hope you all will, uh, escalation is one of those themes. Of course, it's the Barbara Tuckman message as as well. Uh, I've got to just take moderator's prerogative and add one suggested reading of mine. Um, you can do it in half an hour. Just Google Arthur C. Clarke's short story, Superiority. It's about how the side in an interstellar war with the advanced technology was defeated because of their advanced technology which is, I think, another of the subtexts in uh, 2034 as well, which brings us to our uh, period of uh, interaction with uh, students in a question and answer period. Uh, and uh, we're going to begin with Major Nicholas Underwood, who is actually uh, studying the issues of uh, technology strategy. And as Admiral Stavridis knows, he's an Air Force special operator. So I won't uh, repeat his uh, introduction to the Admiral, but to uh, the campus community. He's in the Defense Analysis Department and uh, and doing work in the area of technology strategy. Major Underwood, over to you. Uh, thank you for, and, uh, for coming to us today. Um, question was earlier, uh, been, uh, how can you tell when a service has become over dependent on advanced technology? Uh, is there an inflection point where the advantage gives way to vulnerability? Yeah, that's a, a marvelous question, Nick. And you know, I'm, I'm tempted to say it'll happen right in front of you. And go back to the example of the Battle of Agincourt, where your exquisite technology 
suddenly fails. Or fictionally in the novel 2034, when our protagonist, uh, Commodore Sarah Hunt, is clipping through the South China Sea in command of her three destroyer flotilla, and suddenly she has no communications anymore. Um, those moments will generally be quite apparent to you. But I think there are some tippers that come before those points. And they have to do with how we use training, exercises, and simulations. And I know that Charlie is here at the postgraduate school studying simulations. I think there's an important element of going into exercising and simulations where we deliberately withdraw capability and then see what the result looks like, see if we can overcome that sudden blinding of the elephant. So uh, hopefully you don't have to have an Agincourt moment to realize that you've lost the technological edge because you have invested in training, exercises, simulations, where you methodically, consistently, and fearlessly withdraw capability from the side that you think is going to win and see how it turns out. Perhaps we can benefit from someone else's uh, Agincourt moment if we uh, watch carefully enough. I, I, I note that uh, recently uh, there's been yet another uh, Taiwan defense war game, and uh, once again the island has uh, fallen. And part of it is, again, straight out of your, your book, uh, information, uh, mass disruption of information systems had a, a crippling effect. And I'm just speaking to what's in the public record uh, uh, about the uh, the war game. Uh, we'll get to that with uh, uh, Major Rowan in a, in a few moments. But right now, let's go to Lieutenant Colonel Trier, uh, who's uh, doing national security studies uh, related to the Indo-Pacific theater. He's with the German Army Reconnaissance Branch. Uh, he's been at uh, NATO in Brussels, and he'll be going to the German Ministry of Defense after graduation in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, Colonel Trier, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, as former Sakur and Commerce Yukam, I assume you have made uh, a lot of uh, experience that sometimes um, consensus finding amongst allies is consuming and sometimes leads to solutions that may not always be optimal uh, from an operational point of view. Uh, so my question would be, given your experience, what would be your perspective to the popular assumption that the U.S. would be better off uh, with short-term coalitions of the wing instead of investing further into seemingly unflexible alliances? Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Schoen. Um, I would say that we need both. Um, you know, as a former SACUR, I'm invested in the idea of NATO. And, and let's just, let's stop for a minute and just kind of do the numbers on NATO. They're really quite remarkable. Here is a formal alliance, 30 nations today, has 3 million men and women under arms, almost all of them volunteers, 28,000 combat aircraft, 800 ocean-going capital ships, 50 AWACS, an overall defense budget of $1 trillion, $700 billion U.S., $300 billion European. Um, there has never been an alliance remotely with the capability. And then secondly, it is an alliance with shared values, democracy, liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of education, freedom of the press, gender equality, racial equality. We execute them imperfectly, but they're the right values and we share them. So we should not, in my view, be quick to discard the power of an alliance structure like NATO. Now, alongside that, as we look at the intractable problems of this century, it is clear that we can address them best through less formal structures. And so here I would put something like the coalition against the Islamic State, which my 
dear friend and Naval Academy classmate, General John Allen led after he retired from the military as a presidential envoy. 77 nations are in that coalition of the willing, as you correctly articulate. And that includes not only the 30 nations of NATO, every single one of them is in that, but also many Asian nations, Japan, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Singapore, many Arab nations um, are in it, uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, all the Gulf states. Um, that kind of informal coalition can be very effective. And by the way, as we see today, there is a rising concern about China. How are we collectively going to meet that? It'll be a combination. I think we've seen Secretary General Stoltenberg talk about NATO's role in facing the rise of China. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing a kind of coalition of the willing in the so-called Quad Nations, India, Australia, Japan, and the United States. And by the way, what's happening right now, even as we are having this vibrant discussion tonight, an aircraft carrier strike group is sailing through the South China Sea, except it's not an American strike group. It's a British strike group. It's centered on the Queen Elizabeth, a 65,000 ton aircraft carrier, two British destroyers, two British frigates, a Dutch frigate, an American destroyer, two British logistic ships, a British nuclear powered submarine. That's a carrier strike group. It is there, not exactly representing NATO, but kind of on the cusp of NATO. A lot of the planning was conducted through NATO command structures, and it's there indicating the rise of informal coalitions, putting the Quad alongside the United Kingdom. And by the way, your own nation, as you well know, has committed to deploying a naval warship to the South China Sea to conduct freedom of navigation patrols. The French will continue to do so. Um, alongside Japanese ships, alongside Australian ships. So I think the answer to your question is that formal alliances like NATO, like the bilateral formal alliances the United States enjoys with Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Thailand, even the Philippines, these are formal alliance structures, will continue to matter. And at the same time, informal structures will matter as well. Um, I think there's an unofficial rule somewhere that you should never quote Winston Churchill twice in one evening, but I'm going to do it. Um, the second quote is, it is very frustrating to fight wars alongside allies. It's complicated. It's difficult. But Churchill said, the only thing worse than fighting a war alongside these difficult allies, the only thing worse is fighting a war without any allies. And so the pragmatic part of me says, yeah, NATO can be frustrating at times. Believe me, I know that better than anybody on this call. Um, informal coalitions can be difficult to put together and keep together, but it still beats the hell out of not having any allies with you. That's a wonderful quote from uh, uh, Churchill. It reminds me that the uh, the day he uh, learned of uh, Pearl Harbor, he was uh, in the bathroom shaving. His son Randolph ran up with the news and Churchill turned to his son and just smiled and said, ah, we've won because he knew he now had the coalition partner that would uh, help to win the uh, to win the war. Uh, coalitions, formal or informal, are complicated things, as the Admiral noted. Lots and lots of resources, operations uh, globally, uh, raises the question of logistics. And Captain uh, John Espinosa of the Air Force, uh, who's a, a student in the, the Graduate School of Defense Management, is uh, specializing in the area of innovation, in the area of logistics and supply chains. So uh, over to you, Captain. Next. Thank you, sir, and thank you, Admiral. So the question I have for you actually ties back to your uh, recent drop for uh, 2034. Uh, as a recent graduate student just arriving here, 
uh, what would you recommend is uh, something we should have in our mindset moving forward with geopolitical knowledge? And what areas of research would you recommend we pay attention to? Mm -hmm. Great question, John. And, and here I really want to do a shout out to the Naval Postgraduate School. You know, as, as the saying goes, the Department of the Navy's research university, and it truly is. Um, it is crucial that we continue to invest constantly in, in all of these technologies. But I'm going to I'm going to give you, if you will, my top three or four. Um, I think artificial intelligence is um, going to determine a great deal of how the world moves over the coming decades. And here I'll couple it with quantum computing, which potentially could rearrange the idea of the Internet. We don't have time to unpackage all of this technology, but um, artificial intelligence, I think, is going to have tactical, operational, and strategic impact in ways that are, are difficult to discern right now. Um, because uh, Professor Arquillo uh, gave us a uh, Arthur C. Clarke uh, recommendation, I'm going to have to add an Isaac Asimov, which, of course, is the Foundation Trilogy, uh, which really is all about artificial intelligence and its ability to drive a society and the way you can misstep and misinterpret what you think you're hearing. Um, so I think artificial intelligence, John, is going to be crucial. Um, a, a basic idea, of course, is cyber. And this is what uh, Professor John has written about brilliantly in his book, Bits Creed. Um, there will never be another conflict that does not have a significant cyber component in it. And um, so I'm going to kind of pair those two. Um, thirdly, this one may or may not surprise you, but I think biology is underrated in this regard. And by, by that, I mean human performance enhancement, uh, human life extension, energy from biological sources. Uh, at 300 years from now, when the history of this century is written, um, it potentially will be about artificial intelligence and cyber. It may be more about biology than it is about either of those two. So I'd kind of park those alongside. And where those two kind of come together is what is sometimes called the singularity. And this is this idea of a merge of biology, artificial intelligence, bioengineering, nanotechnology. This is by a man named Ray Kurzweil, written a decade and more ago, but very relevant. So uh, I'll close by saying I've, I've listed some individual technologies, but what really matters is our ability to synthesize them, to understand how they fit together and how the sum will be greater than the, the addition of the individual parts. Well, one of the ways we can help to understand these complexities is through the notion of modeling and simulation, trying to look at this in, in uh, from an artificial perspective. And uh, Major Charlie Rowan, Army uh, um, armor officer who has found his way into modeling and, and simulation, is doing a dissertation on the, uh, the problems posed when your technology creates oceans of new information every every day, every hour. And so how do you avoid information uh, overload? Uh, and Major Rowan, please, to you. Good afternoon, Admiral. Um, so continuing on the thread we spoke about earlier with, with our, our partners and coalitions, uh, just curious from, from your uh, standpoint and from your former desk, how much do you think that recent events uh, in Afghanistan affected our standing with our partners, our adversaries, and, and those somewhere in between as they saw it play out uh, both with the withdrawal and then uh, afterwards with uh, kind of the calls for uh, for everything that happened afterwards that we saw play out on, on Capitol Hill with military leadership. Charlie, uh, you know, I think anybody who has uh, served in Afghanistan, um, I commanded the mission from 2009 to 2013. It's a NATO mission. I had four superb U.S. generals working for me that that were in country. Um, and I went to Afghanistan a couple of times a month for four years, was deeply personally involved. I'm going to begin by saying it hurts all of us. And I, 
I would I would say anybody who served there two two comments. One, think about what you did and what you could have done differently and where did we make mistakes? And in, in my mind, you know, I'm going to I'm going to reach up and grab something here which I keep on my desk. Everybody loves command coins, right? Here's one I keep on my desk. Mm -hmm. That's that's the NATO training mission, Afghanistan. We were very proud of that command. Here's the flip side of it. Three-star commander. Uh, I had superb generals in that job, and we failed. We failed to train correctly an Afghan army. And I think in retrospect, we trained the wrong army. If you want to put it in revolutionary war terms, we trained a bunch of redcoats and we should have trained Minutemen. We should have built an army that looked more like the Taliban. And back to the theme that we've discussed all evening, reliance on technology. We built an army of Afghans who relied on technology. They felt they needed precise intelligence. They needed a golden hour medical evacuation. They needed supporting high-speed fighter air cover. They needed Humvees. They needed boots and Oakley sunglasses. You know, we, we built the wrong army. And so for all of us who are involved in that effort, we need to own that. We need to own the mistakes that we made. And I think that's a big one. Um, there are other reasons that mission failed. Pakistan uh, did us no favors in terms of uh, supporting the Taliban. Um, we ought to credit the enemy. You know, in warfare, the enemy gets a vote. The Taliban overperformed uh, beyond our expectations. Um, we ought to recognize are policy mistakes. Personally, I think it was a policy mistake to walk away, pull everybody out at the moment that we did. It shattered the confidence of the Afghans. Um, you know, we could unpackage all of that, but my, my uber point, as we look at the world post-Afghanistan, we in the military, those of us wearing uniforms, um, have a job to do in understanding where we failed. Our policymakers need to understand where they failed. Our diplomats need to understand where they failed. Afghan leadership failed. Ashraf Ghani, the president, failed. We need to understand that. So point one of how does the world look afterward is how do we learn from it? And, you know, nations are like people. They are going to make mistakes. Sometimes they make big mistakes. Sometimes they make little mistakes. But the measure of any human being is not whether you make mistakes or not. We're all going to make mistakes. The measure is how do you respond? So that's kind of point one. And point two, Charlie, I would say, is that to Afghan veterans in particular, I would say, you got to recognize where we failed, but you also need to celebrate where we succeeded. And we did succeed in the following sense. For 20 years, we held that ground. We stood on a wall. No attacks came from Afghanistan. We went there to stop that. For 20 years, we succeeded in that mission. Along the way, we did some pretty marvelous things in terms of literacy and the role of girls and women. And can the Taliban unwind that? Maybe. We'll see. And, uh, you know, the jury's still out on that piece of the puzzle. So to conclude, as I then look at how the world views it, I think they'll look at it as a tactical failure by the United States. I think more damaging to us is whether or not in places like Taipei, Taiwan, Seoul, Korea, Jerusalem, Israel, in places like that, has the confidence been shaken? I think it's been shaken, but I don't think it's shattered. And therefore, what we do now, you know, see paragraph one about what did we learn? What's our next move is going to matter a lot. 
And therefore, my prescription for the Biden administration would be a lot of personal visits, a lot of exercises and training, a lot of forward leaning engagement with high technology. And a pretty good place to start would be Taiwan, as controversial as that is. And I think sending special forces forward makes sense. Controversial, but makes sense. High-end weapon sales, defensive ones against uh, incoming uh, ships, the so-called naval strike missiles, sea mines, smart mines that can be used at sea, stinger type systems. Um, there's a lot we can do to make the Taiwanese a porcupine that China doesn't want to try and swallow. I think what we do now matters a lot. And engagement internationally is the heart of what we need to do if we're not going to reap the whirlwind that could come out of that particular failure in Afghanistan. So again, shaken but not shattered. That's distinct from a bond martini, shaken but not stirred. Um, this is shaken but not shattered. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, just a footnote, uh, Major Rowan, a lot of people are comparing the uh, fall of Kabul to the fall of Saigon in 1975. Uh, yeah, that was a terrible event in 1975. Fifteen years later, Soviet Union goes out of business and the United States and its allies and the freedom agenda win the Cold War. So beyond adversity, there's learning, there's light, as uh, I just want to second what the Admiral said about an unflinching look at what happened and uh, a confidence uh, in ourselves as we as we move ahead. Can I uh, also add a thought to that, John, which is sure. um, a pretty simple one, which is you never know. You never know how the wheel is gonna turn. And today, Vietnam, arguably, our strongest potential partner in the South China Sea, and boy, do they wanna be with us. Yeah, and, and they, uh, they gave it pretty hard to the Chinese when China invaded them back in 1979. Of course, they gave us a pretty thin time, too. Yeah, so and that's and a I'll, great I'll, point. Exactly. And I'll give you another plus that compares with these two situations. The fall of Saigon led to what? It led to a mass exodus of refugees to the United States of America. The Vietnamese American community, I don't need to tell a bunch of people living in California, have been extraordinary here. I predict the Afghans will be the same. And it, it has nothing to do with Vietnamese or Afghan or wherever people come from. It has to do with how hard it is to run the gauntlet and get here. Whether you're getting out of a falling Saigon or getting out of a falling Kabul, how much courage and true grit and determination does it take to put your two-year-old on your back, grab your four-year-old's hand, and figure out how to get on that plane, how to get on that ship, how to get out of there? I want that person on my team. That's why the Vietnamese who got here have become who they have. And I predict the Afghans will as well. It's the Hunger Games, folks. You want those people here because they won. Here, here. Uh, we have time uh, for uh, uh, one more question and maybe a little more if uh, Admiral Stavridis would like to stay with us for a bit. But let's go to a first to Marine First Lieutenant Emily uh, Hastings, who before uh, coming to NPS was at uh, uh, Marine Fighter Attack uh, Squadron. And she had a couple of fascinating questions. I leave it to you, Lieutenant, to pick which one of your two questions you'd like to ask the Admiral. Over to you. Thank you, Doctor, and thank you so much, Admiral, for taking our questions. Um, I looked into your book, Sailing True North, about the need for good leaders to embody character through discipline. Um, and additionally, you mentioned that creativity and innovation in our current ranks. But to me, those don't always seem to go hand in hand. So my question is, how can we better create leaders that share these same sentiments? And what do we say to the current leaders that do not support organizational change towards building pioneering leaders? Mm. Well, I think this is uh, not only a great question, but a good one to close on because it, it brings us back to the Naval Postgraduate School, which is, as we've talked about, about 
technology, about knowledge, about uh, driving research to find the right answer. But right alongside it, and this is the power of the Naval Postgraduate School, are the fundamental issues you just raised in your question, Emily, which are leadership and character and risk. I think the ability to balance those three things and then harness it with technology is really the key to creating the kind of leaders we want. Um, you know, when I went through the Naval Academy in the late 1970s, otherwise known as 1.2 million years ago, when I went through there, it was all about the science and technology. This was Navy nuclear power and, and you know, mandatory, everybody had to major in uh, to high technology majors. And, you know, I was someone who never quite fit in the, you know, the pegs. And um, because I had a high SAT score in mathematics, probably due to a computer error of some kind, my score was high enough that I was required to major in a technical field. And, you know, thus I did. But my heart was in literature was in the humanities. And so I, I managed doing overloading and coming in the summers and giving up my summer leave to actually do a kind of a combined program in both engineering, electrical engineering principally, and in English literature. And I, I will tell you this, throughout my career, I've touched on both of those, and they've both been important elements in my success. But I'll tell you this, Every single day, I have used the character, the leadership, the writing skills, the communication skills that came with my humanities education. I needed that technology, of course, but it was really the blend, the ability to have both of those that I think is so crucial. And that's why I'm, I'm so pleased to be part of this fora tonight um, to discuss not just um, these kind of technical questions about where our military systems are going, but also how reading and leading fit together and how at the end of the day, we've got to find a way to, to bring those two things together. So uh, my short answer to the question is um, you need both. You need both those skill sets and I think that under the leadership of uh, Admiral Rondeau and with extraordinary professors like John Aquila, um, students like all of you and all of those listening in this community have um, a place where you can pursue both and be part of this uh, marvelous synergy that occurs when you harness both of those streams of human endeavor. Hey, it's been a pleasure being with you tonight. Um, thank you for having me. I hope you all, uh, when it becomes five o'clock in California, you go enjoy a glass of Uzo or a glass of wine. Um, Admiral Rondo, I'll be in touch personally on a couple of different things. Thank you, ma'am. Well, uh, Admiral, that was a wonderful comment to uh, to close on. And uh, on behalf of the whole campus community, uh, you know, our sincerest thanks for your sharing this time uh, with us for the wonderful insights. And, and I think everything you said is so closely in line with what Secretary of the Navy Del Toro has suggested about the need to cultivate breadth and, and depth. With that, I'll pass it over to President Rondo. Admiral, we, we normally give our guest speaker a final word, but I think that your final words were the words of wisdom and insight and, and that will touch our leaders. We will be delighted to have you here anytime. And just thank you. This has been a marvelous time. And and we have a, a, a number of questions that have, have come up in the chat with your permission. I want to say it out loud here. I'll send you those questions just so you see the kinds of things that our people are thinking about and what our students wanted to ask you. I'll be happy to send those to you so that you see those. And I look forward to seeing you sometime to, soon, soon, sir. My pleasure to all. all. All the best. And thank you to the students for some great questions tonight. Thanks, everybody. Hi, sir. Out, out here.